Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary. Would everyone please stand for opening prayer? Heavenly Father, we come before you. Thank you for this beautiful day that we can gather together and worship you and to hear from you, Lord. And we just pray as we begin uh, our study in 2 Timothy this morning that these lessons we would take to heart, Lord, that you would minister to us and we would be open to your Spirit's leading. Bless the people here, those listening on the radio, the internet, and Lord, as always, draw us close to you. We love you, Lord, and Lord, may our hearts be open in our worship this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. And morning, everyone. Um, if we could open our Bibles this morning, please. Um, we're going to read from Psalm 23 this morning, where we are told through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. This morning, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1 as we begin our in-depth study of Paul's second letter to his son in the faith, Timothy. And keep in mind that First and Second Timothy and Titus make up what is known as the pastoral epistles. And thus they were written to young pastors, uh, preachers who, would, uh, who worked with Paul, and just teaching them things. You know, uh, Titus was on Crete, um, Timothy was at Ephesus at the church there. And if you remember from our study from 1 Timothy, Paul was dealing with what the church is all about, the problems in the church, and really, what is the focus of the church? And it's the same thing for uh, Titus and, and 2 Timothy here. But he, he said in 1 Timothy 3.15, If I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And the whole thing is, what is the church to proclaim? The word of God, the gospel message. That's its focus. You know, pillars were, uh, yes, used to support structures, but they also were to put announcements, you might say, on them. And we are a proclaimer, like those pillars were, of the truth, the gospel message. And the foundation of the church, or what the church is built upon, again, is the Word of God. And that's so important for us to understand that. I know I go over that a lot, but in our day, we've lost so much focus of what a church is to be. And it's really simple. You know, when I was in Russia, most of the churches were house churches there. They didn't have, you know, big buildings. But the focus was still the same, proclaiming the gospel message, building people up in the word of God, the foundation, the truth, and the whole counsel of God from Genesis through Revelation. And it's important. You know, you can always see what's being taught by how Christians behave. Because, again, if you're being taught the truth of God found in the Word of God, then God is guiding you how we're to live out our faith, right? And I can, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but have you been convicted in areas of your life that needed to be changed as the Word of God was being taught? I hope so. Because that's the whole point. God is showing us, yeah. We, I mean, I have to admit, the messages are for me. You know, when I'm writing this, I'm going, oh man, that, that just gets me. And, you know, you guys tell me the same thing, that God has spoken to you and there's some things that you need to change, or even words of encouragement, obviously, God gives to us. And, you know, we have to remember, when prior to Paul's writing of 1 Timothy, he was in prison. And we saw that in our study of the book of Acts, you know, when Acts uh, closed, Acts chapter 28, says, then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. 
So Paul is under house arrest, chained to a soldier 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But that's not the end of Paul's story. You know, it kind of ends there in Acts, but Paul was released from prison for a time because there's really no charges against him, and Nero let him go. But I think when Paul had his day with Nero to present his case, he gave him the gospel message. I, I think it was so clear, so black and white, that Nero knew that he was going to reject the truth. It's interesting, you know, I did a funeral several years ago, and, you know, when I do f funeral services, I lay the gospel out. I let people know that there's no middle ground here, that we're all sinners separated from God. And I make it so clear. And I just remember this one service, and here was this guy, and I know God was convicting his heart, because through the whole service, this is what he was doing. The whole service! And I think God was really speaking to him. I pray God just continued to minister to him and brought him to saving faith, because he knew the truth. He just didn't want to hear it. He didn't want to believe it. And he was shaking his head, no, 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 no. Yeah, well, yes, yes, yes. And I think that was Nero. And so Paul's release for a time. He's revisited some of the churches he ministered to, and Ephesus was one of them. And he may have gone as far as Spain. We're not sure on that. But in Ephesus, he saw some of the problems in the church. The false teachers with their false doctrine. Leadership was having some trouble there. Uh, some of them were leading people away from the truths of God found in the Word of God. And so Paul told Timothy, stay here in Ephesus. I want you to take care of the problems here. Get the leadership going. Get them these false teachers out. And he continued on to Macedonia, where then he wrote this first letter to Timothy and Titus, probably around 63-64 AD. Titus written shortly after 1 Timothy. Well, in July of 64 AD, Nero ordered the torching of, torching of his own city, Rome. And according to historians, it was on July 19, 64 AD, that the fire started in the woodsheds near the Circus Maximus. And later on, it was reported that Nero's servants were running from the sheds just before the blaze started, and the fire engulfed the city. Uh, it continued for some 10 days. Two-thirds of downtown Rome was destroyed. And everyone suspected Caesar Nero to be the arsonist. He burned his own city. Why? So he could rebuild it in honor of himself. And it, man, the fire affected everyone, the rich, the poor, political people, religious people. And obviously, they weren't happy. And so Roman historian Tacitus wrote, but of all human efforts, all the lavish gifts of the emperor and the propitiations of the gods did not banish the sinister belief that the fire was the result of an order by Nero. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most tortures on a class hated for the abominations called Christians by the populace. So the people knew that Nero burned Rome, but Nero placed the blame on Christians. They're the ones that started the fire, that burned their homes and businesses and so on. And so this Roman persecution began, and it grew and it grew. Nero had Christians burned at the stake to light his parties. He clothed Christians in animal skins, threw them to wild dogs, and watched them get mauled. Under Nero, um, gladiators uh, crucified and executed Christians. They were torn apart by ferocious lions. In fact, he tied them to poles and poured pitch on them and lit them on fire, rode through the streets on his chariot naked, watching them burn to death. He was relentless and merciless. And so even though Paul, uh, Paul was released from his first Roman imprisonment by Nero, Paul's rearrested now. He's put in chains. He's in a Roman prison. He's not... Uh, given a nice place to live. He was as a common criminal. criminal, And Paul was a Roman citizen. And he couldn't be thrown to the lions. He couldn't be crucified. So he was awarded the easiest form of execution the Roman government afforded its capital offenders. That was death with a sword by decapitation. They cut his head off. So this persecution grew in around 66 A.D., uh, Paul was placed, again, not under house arrest, but in a dungeon, basically called the Mamertine Prison. 
Uh, it was just a hole in the ground, basically. Uh, he had very little food. It was dark. It was cold, damp, filthy. It stunk. I mean, there weren't bathroom facilities, buckets. And don't think they cleaned them very often. And you can visit the Mamertine prison in Rome today. It's just a holding cell before you were put to death. And that's where Paul was at. And the setting now for 2 Timothy is Paul's in prison. He's awaiting his death, and he's writing to his son in the faith what's upon his heart. It's his, might say, his last will and testament. And here in 2 Timothy, Paul's going to deal with the coming apostasy, which I think we see in our day uh, growing, and he wants Timothy to combat this. J. Vernon McGee put it like this. He said, in this little book of 2 Timothy, an ominous dark cloud is seen on the horizon. It is the coming apostasy. Today, apostasy has broken like a storm, like a Texas tornado on the world and in the church. What do we mean by apostasy? Webster defines apostasy as total desertion of the principles of faith. So apostasy is not due to ignorance. It's a heresy. Apostasy is a deliberate error. It is intentional departure from the faith. An apostate is one who knows the truth of the gospel and the doctrines of the faith and has renounced them. Keep in mind, J. Vernon McGee went to the, be with the Lord like 30, 40 years ago. And he was writing of the apostasy he saw in his day. Could you imagine what he'd be writing today? Spurgeon wrote of it. What, a hundred years ago? Could you imagine what he would be writing today? In fact, Paul is going to say this in 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 through 5. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Why? Because the time's going to come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they're going to heap up from themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables, fairy tales. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. You know, preaching the word. Paul is going to say the word of God is, is given by the very breath of God to us in chapter 3. So how do you deal with this apostasy? You preach the word, you preach the truth. Now, Nero, prior to him going crazy, was a pretty nice guy. Not bad. I mean, he was still evil, but he wasn't this evil, okay? What happened to this guy? Well, we don't know for sure, but I think it was this witness of the gospel, like I had said. I think, and it's very possible he became demon-possessed at this time, because when you read of the things that this guy did, yeah, they're not normal, okay? Not at all. Something happened. And he went insane. He hardened his heart to this truth that Paul had shared with him about Jesus Christ, that he needed to repent of his sins, he needed to turn to the living God and ask him to be Lord and Savior of his life. And Nero heard the truth. He knew it was the truth, but he rejected the truth. And out of this is all this anger and violence towards, towards Christians. You know, a short time after this letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy, he was martyred for his faith. In fact, according to tradition, he was beheaded for his faith on the Ostian Way, west of Rome, by orders of Nero. And that, you read this letter and you know Paul saw his life coming to an end. He knew this was it. He knew he was not going to be released this time like he was released the first time. And so the things that he's saying are very important. And for us, what are we leaving behind? What are we leaving our children, our grandchildren, our neighbors, our friends, other family members? You know, I'm sure all of you know of Pringles, the potato chip, right? The Pringles creator, you know, the potato chips in a can, Frederick Bauer, died in 2008, and he requested that his assage be placed in a Pringles can, and they were. <laughs> I'm not sure on this. This is just speculation. I think it was a spicy can, but I'm not sure. <laughs> speculation. Don't know for sure. 
Then there was the Frisbee creator, Ed Hedrick. And his request, he had his ashes molded into Frisbees and given to his family and friends. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be, you know, flinging my mother around like a Frisbee. I, I think that's bizarre, don't you? I don't know. It, that, maybe that's just me, but that's what he did. Um, you know, during this battle in the Civil War, Union General uh, stood watching over the wall, and his officer said, you know what, get down. Don't be putting your head up there. And he said, there's no way. I'm not putting my head down. He said, they couldn't hit an elephant at this dis. That was it. Yeah, I guess they hit him. That's famous last words, you know. But what about great famous last words? You know, Pistol Pete Maravich, he was a basketball player. He died as he lived. He was collapsed during a game of basketball at a church gym. And shortly before his death, this is what he wrote. I have finally realized after 40 years that Jesus Christ is in me. Wow, what a thing to leave behind, right? Those are famous last words. It wasn't about Pistol Pete, the great basketball player, but on Jesus Christ and what he's done in his life. Many of you will know Jim Elliott, the missionary who was martyred way back in 1956 at the age of 29. He wrote, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Yeah, famous last words. Missionary C.T. Studd, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Yeah. And this is Paul's famous last words, you might say. His life is going to be over when this letter ends. And he's sitting in this filthy prison. And he's not focused on himself. What is he focused on? on Timothy and the Lord. He wants to pass this on. He lived what he believed. And a, a theme for this letter, faithfulness in the face of hardship. That's what I see. What about the days we're living in? Yeah, Lord, help me to be faithful in the hardships that we are facing. You know, I talked to some of you and some of the things you're going through, you go, man, it's never been like this. Yeah, I think it's more intense now. I think the pressure is heating up. For us, and we need to know how to live out our faith even during these hardships. I've called our study this morning Passing the Torch. Why? Because again, Paul's life is ending, and he's saying, Timothy, you're now taking over. I'm passing the torch on to you. I want you to continue on in the faith. I want you to continue doing the work of the ministry. And I've broken the verses down, and again, these are in your bulletin, into three points life, not death. 2 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1. love for Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, verses 2 through 5, and keep the fire burning in 2 Timothy 1, verses 6 and 7. So let's pick up in first, or 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, and let's see what the Lord has for us this morning as we study his word. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul and Timothy knew each other, right? Why did he have to list his credentials, expound on his calling to Timothy? Right? It just seems redundant, you know? If I'm away and I'm writing a card to Julie, I'm not going to say, Joe, your husband, right? She pretty much knows who I am. I'm her husband. So why is he doing this? Well, remember, these letters were not just for Timothy. They were for other churches. It was for the church there in Ephesus as well. And so these were to be read, and Paul wanted them to know that this calling was from God. It, this was not the will of man. He had the authority then to speak for God. And these were not words that were born out of the heart of Paul, but out of the mouth of God to Paul. And, you know, that should be our lives, right? All that we do, it's a calling from God placed upon our lives. Being in nursing for 30 years, I, I truly believe that was a calling of God for my life. I, I saw God work so many different ways. There were, yes, there were times in there that I was very frustrated. Lord, nothing's happening. But God was still working. I just wasn't seeing it. And then he showed me. And I know that was a calling. Being a, the pastor here is definitely a calling. I know exactly when he called me to be a pastor here in Wisconsin, to be more specific. And you know what? 
if it's not a calling, you're going to be frustrated and you're going to just stop the work. You're going to drop out. When you know what God has put upon your life, nothing's going to move you. And that was Paul. I mean, I don't think about it. You're put in prison for sharing the gospel, right? You didn't do commit any crime. And it's cold, damp, it stinks. The food is very rare, you know. He, Paul needed some clothing brought to him. We're going to read that as we finish for uh, 2 Timothy. It was horrible. And Paul doesn't write, you know, how bad it is. He's writing about the Lord and encouraging Timothy to continue on in the work. Why? Because he knew his calling. And I think it's important for us. He also speaks of the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. Why? Because he's going to die. <laughs> right? He's going to be put to death. His life is not focused upon his physical life, but the life that is to come. I mean, he's waiting for his death. But more importantly, he's waiting for Christ. You know, it, if we're so focused on this life, then anytime something happens, it's going to be glo a gloomy cloud. But for Paul, it was a glorious sunrise. Why? Because Jesus guaranteed him life. But he knew his life, this physical life was coming to an end, but man, he's going to be with the Lord. That's the proper perspective. You know, when he was in prison the first time and he wrote Philippians, listen to what he said, because keep in mind, he was going to be released. He, he felt very certain about that. But in Philippians 1, verses 21 through 26, he wrote this. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell, for I'm hard-pressed between the two having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy and faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Paul's like, man, I'm ready to go home. I'm ready. I'm in prison. I'm ready to go home. But you know what? I don't think it's time. I think God wants me to minister to you a little bit more and so I'm going to build you up in the faith. Now we're at a different period of time in Paul's life. Now he's in prison again. He's in the Mamertine prison. He's going to be put to death, and he understands that. He's going to be taken home to glory very soon. You know, in Valladolid, Spain, where Christopher Columbus died in 1506, there's a mon monument commemorating this great discoverer. They didn't tear it down yet, so it's still there. Uh, and what's interesting is it's a statue of a lion destroying one of the Latin words that had been put on part of Spain's motto for centuries. And before Columbus made his voyage, the Spaniards thought that they had reached the outer limits of the earth. And their motto was, ni plus ultra, or no more beyond. This is it. This is as far as we can go. The word being torn away by the lion is the knee or no, meaning making it read plus ultra, and he had proven there was more beyond. And that was Paul. Paul knew there was more beyond this life. This was temporary. This was not going to be eternal in these bodies. Or when these bodies go back to the dust of the earth, there's the cessation of life. There's nothingness. Not at all. He knew to be absent from the body, he was going to be with the Lord. He was confident of that. And yeah, you know, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said that Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ that is coming. So because he rose, we will rise one day, and that is a promise of God. And the wonderful thing is God doesn't go back on his word. I love that. You know, if you've repented of your sins and asked Jesus to be Lord and Savior of your life, you're going to be raised in glory. If you rejected that, 
The ultimate end is the lake of fire for eternity. And why can't these bodies, these fleshly bodies, go into heaven? Because of the sin nature that's still with us. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 said we all need to be changed. These bodies are going to be changed, just like the Lord's was when he rose from the grave, right? It was still flesh and blood in that you could touch Jesus, right? Jesus ate. So, you know, we marriage supper of the lamb, guys. Lots of food. So we'll have bodies that you could touch. We're not going to be like Casper the ghost where, you know. But we'll have, they'll be different like Jesus, resurrected body. You know, you plant a, a corn seed in the ground and a corn stalk and eventually a corn cob grows from that seed. It doesn't look like the seed, but it's related to the seed. And that's true with our bodies. You know, Paul, again, said that in 2 Corinthians 5. We're always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. When these bodies go back to the dust of the earth, we are immediately with the Lord. And God is preparing us down here for heaven. And I think that should give us great comfort, hope. I think a lot of people have no hope about what happens when we die. They speculate. You know, there are those who believe in reincarnation. Can you prove reincarnation? Can you prove the resurrection life? Well, absolutely. Look at Jesus. Look at the evidence for him. Look at the witnesses that saw the risen Christ. Look at how being in the tomb, while well, being crucified, spear put in his side. He was dead, okay? Rome knew how, knew how to kill people. They were really good at it. Placed in a tomb, Roman seal on the sto- one-ton stone that covered the door to the tomb, Roman guards guarding the tomb, and people have the idea, because they don't want to believe in the resurrection, that the disciples stole the body of Jesus. None of them were even at the crucifixion because they were terrified. Why? Well, John was there because they were afraid of Rome that this would happen to them. They were terrified. No one was there except John. So they stole the body. Some say it was a hallucination. Well, man, you got 500 people hallucinating the same thing at the same time? Really? That's pretty good. Others said Jesus just fell asleep. You know, he passed out. Well, let me do that to you and see how you respond to it. You, you'd be dead. Remember when they put the spear, the Roman soldier put the spear in his side and blood and water came out. What does that mean? Well, it means that he pierced the heart of Jesus. Blood and water. Pericardial sac around the heart has fluid around it. That water and blood flowed. So he was dead. Now Spurgeon... Now, he just said it as it was. He said, Truly it is never a pleasant sound, that rattle of clay upon the coffin lid, earth to earth, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. Nor to the farmer for its own sake would it be a very pleasant thing to put his grain into the dull, cold earth, and yet I know no farmer ever weeps when he sows his seed. Isn't that an interesting perspective? It, I, I love the way Spurgeon wrote. Um, it's, it just gives us a good perspective on things. But again, you know, these bodies, flesh and blood, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Corruption, uh, inherit incorruption, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. They need to be changed. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad. I mean, you know, what my dad did when he used to get up from the chair when he was older, I'm doing. I inherited that. <laughs> you know, Paul said we groan in these bodies. <laughs> I guess I'm being very biblical, right? You guys too, you know what I mean. These bodies are going to be changed. 
we're going to get new bodies for our spirit and souls to dwell in, eternal bodies that are never going to fade away, that are never, I mean, I'm not going to have to take Motrin. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> leg cramps, no. Restless legs, no. Awesome things. Insulin. I won't have to take insulin. You know, the, you'll see me, man, at the marriage supper of the lamb, I'll be eating like crazy, okay? Because <laughs> I don't think you gain weight either, which is really cool. <laughs> But again, they are physical bodies. Remember what Jesus said to Thomas, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Because that was one of the other things Jesus just rose spiritually. And, you know, no, you could touch him. So we're going to be changed. We're going to get those new bodies. And, you know, it's interesting because in that section where Paul's talking about that we're going to be changed, that we're going to get these new bodies, he also says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor or your toil is not in vain in the Lord. In other words, keep serving the Lord until the day you go home to be with him. Don't give up. Keep doing it. Your work isn't empty. You know, we think, oh, nothing's happening. You know, I, I talk with people and nothing happens. What does Paul say? Your labor is not empty. It's not vain. It's going to accomplish something. But I don't see it. Do you have to? Or could you just believe it? See, that's the thing. Our radio station, it's so fascinating to me because I don't know how many people listen to it, but I always hear people say, who don't come to this church, they say, oh yeah, we listen to your radio station. Thanks, man. I get people support the station who I don't even know who they are, but they listen to it. Praise the Lord. I don't have to know. All I have to do is be faithful and do what God has called me to do and let him bring the fruit in. So for Paul, he's not talking about death. He's talking about life, right? He knew he was physically dying, going to be put to death for his faith, but he knew, hey, I'm going to be with the Lord. Well, as we read on here, we see his love for Timothy. Look at verse 2 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. To Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears that I may be filled with joy, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. This is kind of like a father exhorting his son one last time before he dies. He wants to give Timothy the tools, the warnings, the exhortations to continue in the work as the torch is being passed down to him from Paul. And it's interesting because in the pastoral epistles, uh, we see Paul use uh, mercy added to grace and peace. In the other epistles, it's grace and peace, but he adds the mercy here. Why? Well, because a pastor needs, a leader needs more mercy. And as we receive the mercy of God into our lives, not getting what we deserve, we can minister the mercy of God to others. You know, Spurgeon put it like this. He said, did you ever notice this one thing about Christian ministers? That they need even more mercy than other people. Although everybody needs mercy, ministers need it more than anybody else. And so do we. For if we are not faithful, we shall be greater sinners even than our hearers. And it needs much grace for us always to be faithful. And much mercy will be required to cover our shortcomings. So I shall take those three things to myself, grace, mercy, and peace. You may have the two, grace and peace, but I need mercy more than any of you. So I take it from my Lord's loving hand, and I will trust and not be afraid despite all my shortcomings comings and feebleness and blunders and mistakes in the course of my whole ministry. Yeah. You know, keep in mind that the peace of God is found in the grace of God. It's found in Jesus. And grace is getting something we don't deserve, eternal life. We don't deserve it. He freely gives it to us. And 
you know, mercy is not getting what we deserve. We deserve death. But he doesn't give us death. We have life. And it's out of that grace, that mercy, that we have peace, right? I'm not getting what I deserve, death. I'm getting what I don't deserve, life. Oh, thank you, Lord, because it gives me great peace. It gives me great comfort in my daily life, knowing that you completed the work, and I'm receiving it now by faith. Thank you, Lord. Paul also says that he serves the Lord with a pure conscience. He served the Lord faithfully is the idea. You know, the, there was a ship, the Columbia Esalon, used by the University of Miami to collect chemical, physical, and biological data on the currents off the Florida Straits. And the whole idea was to gather this data so they can manage oil spills. And the ironic thing about this is that while they were working in the Florida Keys, they ran aground and 250 gallons of diesel fuel was pumped into the ocean. So being, not being just not being part of the solution, they became the problem. And we have to be careful. As ministers, how we present ourselves, how we present the message, because we're ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ, sharing our faith, exhorting brothers and sisters in the Lord. And we need to be faithful. Now here's something that's kind of interesting in verse 3. He says that I'm doing this as my forefathers did. Well, man, when you look at the children of Israel, they didn't do too good, did they? I mean, over and over. In fact, God called them stiff-necked, right? Rebellious. Well, what's Paul talking about here? What does he mean? I think when he speaks of forefathers, he's speaking of those who love the Lord. We're awaiting the Lord. Not those that just gave lip service. And there were those. I mean, you look at Abraham, you look at Isaac, even Jacob. Did they have bad days? Yeah. Do we have bad days? Yeah. We all do. We all struggle. It's a battle every day. Even David, a man after God's own heart, right? What happened with David? Well, got into adultery and murder of the woman that of the husband of the woman he had an affair with and had a child with. Two capital crimes. He should have been put to death. But again, grace and mercy extended to David by God because he repented. Not perfect people. But Paul says, man, I, I, I follow them. They're examples. I try to live for them. And Paul loved to see genuine faith. And it wasn't for Paul, people that came and played church. You know, we, it's interesting. We can all put on a great show. You know, how's everything going in your life? You know, hey, everything's great. I, I don't have any problems. And, you know, my response is, you're a liar. There is no one that doesn't have any problems. I'm really sorry. We're living in a fallen world. How could you not have problems? Do you live in a bubble? And even if you did, you still deal with your own issues, Right. But Paul was looking for genuine faith, people who love the Lord, not perfect people. And Timothy was one of those guys that he saw him as faithful. Did Timothy have struggles? Sure. Like I said, we all do. And Paul helps trying to help him. And it says, you know, that there's these tears from Timothy. And I think it could be maybe when Paul left him there in Ephesus that it was hard for Paul to let Paul or hard for Timothy to let Paul go. Could have been his Roman imprisonment. Yeah, that's hard. Even that Paul was going to be put to death soon. They were close. And Paul loved Timothy. I think at times, you know, we think if we are sad or we're emotional or we cry, something's wrong with our faith. We're human. God made us emotional people. Do we hurt? Absolutely. When a loved one dies, does it hurt? Do we cry? Absolutely. But if they were Christian, we know they're going to heaven. Why are we crying? Because we miss them. That's why. We miss them. 
So, yeah, I, 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 there's nothing wrong with what Timothy is doing here. And then Timothy expounds, or Paul expounds on Timothy's faith. Timothy came, and his family came from the city of Lystra. Paul visited there on his first missionary journey in Acts 14. Timothy had an unbelieving Greek father, a believing Jewish grandmother named Lois, and a believing Jewish mother named Eunice. His, first his grandmother got saved, then his mother, and then Timothy was saved, I think, on their, Paul's first missionary journey, but we're not sure. And, it, you know, as you look at how, what Paul says of Timothy, it seems like Paul led Timothy to Christ, his son in the faith. And again, this genuine faith is unhypocritical. And it dwelt in his grandmother, in his mother, and in Timothy. You know, it wasn't a, a, this faith that waxed and waned or just went away. It was there for a short time, not just a visitor. It made its home in their heart. Well, not here, but in Acts, we see that on Paul's second missionary journey, he came to Lystra again, and Timothy a believer with a good reputation, Paul takes Timothy with him. And now we know he's overseeing the church in Ephesus. Was Timothy's home life ideal? Well, no, he had an unbelieving Greek father, a believing a Jewish grandmother and mother. So it wasn't easy, and the father had authority over the family. But what's interesting is it didn't stop his mother and grandmother from teaching Timothy the things of God. And, you know, I'm sure being brought up taught the, the Jewish, the Old Testament, right? And here comes Paul now saying, you know what, that all those scriptures, they're speaking about Jesus and led them to the Lord. He knew what the Old Testament scripture said because he was taught from a young child. But now they're brought to, light, to the light of Jesus and he comes to saving faith. And again, how situations may not always be ideal, but don't let them distract you from God who takes the impossible and makes it very possible. And so here's Paul who loves Timothy and wants to encourage him and guide him. And, you know, I don't know about you, but for me, for my wife and my children and my grandchildren, my family, man, I, don't, I want to leave an example of God's love and, to them. And I want to train them up. Just like, you know, I always pray, Lord, bring someone into this church who would eventually take over. A son in the faith, you might say, who can carry on the work of the ministry when I'm gone. And I'm not going anywhere that I know of. The Lord does, but... I'm pretty healthy, right, Julie? Yeah, so-so. <laughs> but Paul loved Timothy. And lastly here, we see Paul talk about keep the fire burning. Look at verse 6. Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You know, way back in 1 Timothy 4.14, Paul told Timothy, Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. You think, well, Timothy, why are you neglecting this gift? God has given it to you. They prayed over you. Why are you not using the gift that God has given to you? Well, it's interesting. Maybe fear. We don't know. Timothy wasn't like the Terminator or the Rock. He was kind of a timid guy. Paul was bold. You know, Paul didn't really care what people said for the most part. Timothy was a little bit more timid. And Paul's saying, man, you got to stir those flames and use that gift that God has given you. Now, we also have to understand, you know, Roman persecution was growing. And Timothy saw what happened to Paul. And maybe Timothy's thinking, you know what, I, I'm a little nervous here. Maybe I, I shouldn't use this gift that God has given me. I don't want to go to prison. I don't want to die. 
keep in mind that Christians in the persecution, there were over 6 million martyred for their faith in 300 years. Think about that. 300 years, 6 million Christians put to death for their faith. And so lots of problems there in the church in Ephesus. Maybe you didn't want to rock the boat, cause problems, laying low. And Paul says, Timothy, you got to stir up those gifts, man. Stir things up. Use it or lose it. And that's what the word stir up speaks of. Stir up a fire to keep it burning bright and strong. If you know anything about a fire, you got to tend to it, right? You know, it would be nice to just to set it up and let it go. But you have to stoke the fire. Sometimes you got to fan those flames to get it going again. you got to take care of it. And that's what Paul's saying. Take care of the gift that God has given you. Stir it up. And Guthrie says that the Greek word stir up means either to kindle afresh or to keep in full flame. Wow. You know, when you look at First and Second Timothy, there is more than 25 different places where Paul is encouraging Timothy to be bold, not to shy away from confrontation, to stand strong where he needs to stand strong. You've been given this gift, Timothy. Stand strong in it. Stir up those flames. Use the gift that God has given you. In fact, in verse 6, he says, Therefore I remind you to do these things, right? And don't forget what I told you. Don't forget to keep those fires of faith burning bright. Use the gifts that God has given you and shine brightly for Jesus. Does that mean it's going to be easy? Absolutely not. You know, try and get a fire going when there's rain coming down, right? Not real easy to do. There's a lot of people that try to quench our fires, to put them out. But you know what? If God's given you the gift, we need to use it. In fact, in 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Wow. There's no reason for those fires to go out because God has given us exactly what we need to keep those fires burning. And again, fear is a big issue for us many times. Situations that we are become timid because we're afraid, we don't like to speak in front of people, maybe, or whatever. We don't like confrontation. I hate confrontation. But, you know, in my position, it's just what happens, you know. Uh, you got to deal with it. You can't ignore it. There's a guy who hid for 32 years fearing punishment of pro-Nazi wartime activity. And he used to cry when he heard happy voices outside. He didn't even show himself at his mother's funeral because of fear. Janice Russ was a young shoemaker when he went into hiding at his sister's farmhouse in June 1945. And he was found years later after she bought a large supply of bread in the nearby village of Zalna. If I had not been discovered, I would have remained in hiding. So I'm happy that this happened, he told a reporter. Throughout those years, he did nothing. He never left his, the house and could only look down at the village in the valley. All those years, he could do nothing because of fear. And he observed what others were doing. And that's like a lot of Christians. They see what people are doing. Oh, look at them. Well, God has gifted every single one of us. Every single one of us. Use the gifts that God has given you. I don't know what my gift is. Pray about it. Get involved in a ministry. See if that's where God has you. If it's not, then try something else. God will guide you. Don't be inside watching what others are doing. Spectators, be involved. And, you know, Paul said in Ephesians, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. He's the one that does exceedingly abundantly. Notice it doesn't say, I'm going to do it. He's going to do it. It's through his power 
that I can accomplish the things that I need to accomplish. It's his power that you could accomplish the things that he wants you to accomplish. Don't let fear stop you. It's an obstacle. Louis Pasteur is reported to have such an irrational fear of dirt and infection, he refused to shake hands. Isn't that weird? Louis Pasteur did not want to shake hands because he was fearful of dirt and infection. That just blew my mind. President and Mrs. Benjamin Harrison were so intimidated by the newfangled electricity installed in the White House that they didn't tear, dare touch the switches. If there were no servants around to turn off the lights when they went to bed, they slept with them on. Uh, crazy. Fear affected their actions, what they did or didn't do. Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin so feared for his safety that his residence in Moscow had eight bedrooms. And each night he would choose a bedroom at random so no one knew where he was sleeping. Yeah, you know, wow. What can we do about it? Well, Johnny had the answer. Johnny, and you're probably going, who's Johnny? Well, I'll tell you, he's a five-year-old boy. He was in the kitchen, and his mother was making supper, and she said, Johnny, could you go into the pantry and get a can of tomato soup for me? But he was afraid. He didn't want to go in there alone. He said, it's dark in there. I'm scared. I don't want to go. She said, oh, Johnny, just go get it. Finally, she said, it's okay, Johnny. It's all right. Jesus will be with you in there. Well, he was still a little hesitant, but he walked to the door and he opened the door slowly and he peeked inside and it was very dark. And he was going to leave, but then he thought about what his mother said, that Jesus will be with me in there. So he said, Jesus, if you're in there, could you hand me a can of tomato soup? <laughs> okay. But at least he knew Jesus was in there, right? Yeah. We have to understand that God is with us. I will never leave you or forsake you. Thank you, Lord. And you know what the word never means in the Greek? What does it mean? Thank you very much. You guys have been here for a while. It means never. I will never leave you or forsake you. I love that. You know, John said in 1 John 4, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. Isn't that true? Torment in our lives. And we've all been there. Where we are just tormented by what we're going through. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Thank you, Lord. I don't have to fear anything because you're with me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What can we do? Well, like I said, in verse 7 here of, of 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul said, first of all, God has given us power, dunamis in the Greek. We get our English words dynamic or dynamite from. God, by his spirit, has given to us the power we need to accomplish the work he wants us to do. You know, probably heard this story, but there was a hurricane in the U.S. in the morning after the storm, the citizens emerged from their homes and shelters to look at all the damage that was done. And the power of the storm was clear to one investigator who saw this and was dumbfounded by this. And other people came to check it out. And here was a common plastic drink, drinking straw driven deep into a telephone pole by the winds. Under normal circumstances, a straw could never penetrate a telephone pole. But what helped it? was the tremendous power of the wind that had driven the straw into the wood like a spike. That's us. Can we ever penetrate our cynical culture with the good news God has given to us? Yeah. Why? Because of the source of the power. Not because of me. The source of the power. If I rely on my own strength and methods, then no. We can't make a difference. But if we choose to be driven by God's limitless power, we're like that straw in the hurricane where nothing can stop us. We can make that kind of difference. That's God. So power, dunamis, dynamite power, the Holy Spirit. Secondly, God has given us unconditional love, agape love. The power God has given to us is manifested in what? 
in the love we have towards others. Now, we've seen Christians that go out and the things they say and do, they're doing with a lot of power, but there's no love involved. When we do anything, it needs to be done in the power of God through the love of God, that unconditional love. Because if our love is not based in that unconditional love of God, we're going to go around crushing others. You know, the old Godzilla movies, right? We're stomping on the buildings and people and stuff. No, that's not what we're supposed to be like. The love of God. And lastly, God has given us a sound mind. One that is calm, that is self-controlled. That's the idea with the Greek word for sound mind. A love that doesn't fly off the handle. A love that's not out of control. No confusion or panic should be in us. How important is it in a world today that's crazy? You know, you look at things, you go, how could that be? You know, we've dumbed down a generation of kids. There was one reporter going around asking like 20-something-year-olds uh, questions. One of the questions was, what year did the War of 1812 start? Um, 1969? What? And they were, I mean, it wasn't like a joke. Wow. See, that would be hard for me to be under control in that one. And, 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 the, and the guy would just go, yes, that's right. <laughs> he was just joking with them. But yeah, the guy got a total, he had no idea the War of 1812 was in 1812. But again, resting in the Lord in his peace in our lives. You know, God doesn't give up on us. Are we going to stumble and fall? Absolutely. But you know what? God is always there to pick us up, to encourage us. He knows our frame. And we are to love people like that. You know, it's interesting because with kids, if they fall and hurt themselves, how you respond is how they're going to respond. You know, my little granddaughter, Delta, several weeks ago, was playing and uh, she fell forward and hit her face. And she started to cry. I picked her up and she was crying really hard. I gave her to her mom. And her mom was just very calm. And she stopped crying. Why? Because of the comfort of the mom. Now, if her mom was freaking out, oh my gosh, she would have freaked out. But she didn't. The calm. And it's interesting. I mean, she had a big bruise on her face, but she's laughing now and you know, smiling. And I'm, no, she didn't have a concussion. But you know, it was amazing to see the, how she changed. How were we responding to people? How were we comforting them? You know, I think it's important. We have to deal with issues many times in people's lives. <laughs> And can we have a sound mind as we speak to them, as we share with them, as we comfort them? And sometimes, you know, when people are going through something really hard, you don't have to say anything. You just have to be there and show you care and you love them because that says a lot. There may be a time for you to speak, but maybe it's not at that point. That's that power, that love, that sound mind all working together with the gift of, that God has given to you to minister to people with. Power, love, and a sound mind. Wow. And Paul is passing the torch of ministry to his son and his faith, Timothy. And again, we're going to see this letter is filled with warnings and encouragement for Timothy to continue on. We'll see next time that Paul wants Timothy to stand tall. Stand tall in the faith, man. Don't give up. Don't be afraid. You know, I love this because we are all mentoring someone. We're all helping someone. And we could take these tools, and we don't have to be afraid, but with power, love, and a sound mind, we can minister to people. 
because it's God who's working in us then and through us to touch the lives of others. Let's pray. Father, we thank you as we begin this new letter, uh, Paul's letter to Timothy. Uh, just pray, Lord, keep our hearts open. We thank you for the examples, examples, the lessons you have for us. And Lord, just again, may it not just be that head knowledge where we know these things, may we apply them to our lives. Help us to grow in our walk with you, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.